Hello everyone, this is the Mighty Clustic and I am AJ. How's it going? Madness, decay, evil, entropy, utter destruction, nihilism and cold. Today, I'm going to talk about the evil god, Pharaoh's Doom. Created by Gary Gygax, based largely on the work of Robert J. Kuntz, uh, appearing in print for the first time in 1982 and the first adventure for the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons rules, the Forgotten Temple of Pharaoh's Doom is set in the world of Greyhawk. This adventure features gnomes, norkers, creatures from the Fiendfolio, and the player characters exploring a dark path to hidden cult shrines in an, uh, to an imprisoned god. Each step closer uh, risks a descent into madness, as they must perform rituals and expose their minds to evil and despair. Anyone who has played a decent game of Call of Cthulhu will know the feeling well. There is a kind of exhilaration as the characters are compelled to investigate, even though you know it's sure to get them killed in some horrid fashion. The urge to know more is too strong for good judgment to overrule. Thoreau's Dune is directly inspired by the influence of H.P. Lovecraft on early cosmic horror fiction. He is the great old one of D&D, and I'm very happy to delve into the history and lore of this figure, because it seems like I have mentioned him more than a few times in the past. The interesting thing with D&D is that although Io... Uh, Ao is uh, credited with maintaining cosmic law and order. Nothing is really said about the creation or origin of the D&D universe, the various realms, and uh, as is the case with Tharazdun and Oberynth, there are beings that predate the universe of D&D, things that come from the void beyond space and time. First and foremost, it's important to point out very clearly that Tharazdun is called the Mad God or God of Madness for very good reason. He is stark, gibberingly insane. His phenomenal psyche is a font of twisted perspectives and brutal conclusions. The most corrupting horrors boil through his every thought. Nothing is too debased and nihilistic. Nothing can deter Tharazdun from his ultimate goal, the destruction of everything. And the really gnarly part is that this reasoning is fairly valid from a certain point of view. Cosmic horror works best when the player characters, and thus the players, have a lead on something fantastic. The lore may have all the hallmarks of a heroic quest or lead on, on a lead on an, um, an evil cult emerging. And the thrall, uh, trail of breadcrumbs are clues that point toward their secret temple or shrine. Perhaps a mage finds a tome of forgotten spells hidden within the text of a religious uh, a religion long forgotten. Um, and these are, these are powerful spells, spells of destruction. One must simply work through the rituals to reveal the hidden lore. One must simply venture into the deep and unseal ancient barriers. One must simply follow the cultists to the ancient stone circle hidden with the vast dark caverns. One need only risk a little bit at a time, each step bringing new tantalizing rewards, but also an incremental price to be paid in sanity um, and, and safety and in innocence. So, <clears throat> what form does Theradin's evil take? What are the motivations of his madness? Why would he be compelled to dominate all other gods and destroy the entire universe? Well, from his perspective, it's actually logical to do so. Nothing has convinced him that his course of action is an error, and no amount of resistance is going to stop, stop him in his task. But why? Well, there is an answer. First, though, uh, where is Therizdin now and where does and how does he influence the realms at this time? Deep within the ethereal plane, a crystal formation of deep purple substance over a mile across drifts through the mists, surrounded by a frothing and seething border of dream and nightmare. Any being whose mind is vulnerable to manipulation must stay away from this place. To approach is to invite the loss of one's mind and to potential uh, to potentially be in, uh, in prison for eternity. This is the demi-plane of imprisonment, created in an unprecedented act of cooperation by all the gods and many primordials in a last-ditch effort to tap, trap Therizdun and halt his destruction of reality. Therizdun had uh, used a, a weapon of incredible power and created a force of unstoppable chaos and is himself a truly immortal being and the other, so other gods simply cannot kill him. Truly, this is an action of a mad god. And what possible motive would drive him to not only uh, drive an artifact that tears open and corrupts alternate realities into the very forge of elemental creation, but also use that creative force to spawn a limitless army of soulless demons? 
Like Ao, Tharazdun existed before the D&D universe. He seems to be an almost an exact opposite of Ao in so many ways, a, a dark reflection. And looking at the cosmic wheel between the seven rising mountains of Celestia and the 666 ev- uh, ever plummeting layers of the abyss, there lies an impossible tower of neutrality, and at its apex, the city of Sigil and the mysterious Lady of Pain, a being who denies all access to Sigil to any of the gods. Could it be that just as Ao is the ultimate force of law in the D&D pantheon, the Lady is the ultimate force of neutrality, and Tharazdun is the ultimate force of chaos? But chaos is not simply destruction, it's also creation and change. Are these three being aspects of the same overgod? Well, let us look at all the events that led up to Tharazdun creating the abyss and demonkind. There are two or other forces that come from beyond the material plane, the, the astral sea, elemental chaos, ethereal plane, or the celestial or infernal realms, and that's the far realm and the dying universe that spawned the nightmarish Oberynths. The Oberynths found a way to break out of their reality and into the D&D universe, into the realms, the crystal spheres, and in doing so, as far as Tharazdun is concerned, they ruined perfection. They destroyed the law and order and passed ultimate authority over the realms from Ao to Tharazdun himself. As far as he sees it, reality was broken. Law was no longer dominant. The universe was now ultimately ruined and fated to fall to entropy and chaos, the domain of the mad god. And it's true. Eventually the stars will burn out and plunge into black holes. The light will dim and vanish. The worlds will become frozen and dead. There will be only a nearly eternal night, a void of endless despair. This era of void will last so long, as far as Theros is concerned, it is the normal state of the universe, thanks to the Oberynth fouling it up. It is already dead, it's just a matter of time, so why prolong this process? Why not just get it over with and clear the slate, ready to start a new, restored and perfected universe, free of the Oberynth blight? Well, to the other gods, of course, they have many arguments against this. They say, what of life? What of these souls, these precious worlds, our worshippers, our faithful, we need them to survive. Therosden needs no worshippers, nor does Ao, nor does the Lady of Pain. Also, thanks to the pan-dimensional nature of the greater gods, Therosden exists and his history exists on more than one realm. So on um, Uith, oh wow, I really don't like how that's pronounced. Let's just call it Greyhawk. Uith? Jeez. Uh, he is opposed by Palor and Bacob. Greyhawk is a fascinating realm in that it is a geosystem, not a solar system. The sun orbits the world of Greyhawk, not the other way around. But anyway, Therosden's action are part of the nature of his pan-dimensional awareness and presence. The Oberynth, trapped in the last dying light of the Earth universe, tapped into the mind of Therosden, or one of his many aspects within different realities, and using the object known as the Shard of Ultimate Evil, tore their way into the D&D material plane, and offered up their corruption and malice to Therosden, who was now driven to his relentless drive towards destroying the, and recreating the universe anyway. The Oberynth urged him to take the shard and plunge it into the astral sea, and through the, the link to all living thought, corrupt and destroy the gods and render all mortal beings hopelessly insane. However, Therosden may be crazy, but he's not stupid, so instead he went to the heart of the elemental chaos and drove the shard so hard into it, it blasted right through hundreds of alternate realities, a pan-dimensional crossfold rift of epic proportions that is vast on a scale beyond, beyond what you may have once assumed. Okay, we're gonna get to that in a second. Each of those layers of the abyss is another universe that Therosden broke into and corrupted, which in turn drove his counterpart in that dimension into madness and relentless drive of destruction. And the horrific evil ev- evidenced on each of these myriad domains of nightmare and torment is merely the various death throes of other universes, which have fallen to their own mad god of chaos. Have they also got their own version of the abyss? Is there any end to this destruction, or is it a disaster that is destroying every reality, reality in the entire multiverse? Could it be that this is part of the reality that Ao, the Lady of Pain, and Therosdun exist in, on a scale, on an order of magnitude greater than all the other gods of the D&D realms? Such is the nature of dimensions. You get into thinking of the largest thing that encompasses all other things inside it, and then step it up another notch, and you're now looking at a higher dimensional reality that is just very difficult to really comprehend and it seems like madness 
and it is. By now, your feverish investigations have left your character physically and mentally corrupted, a mutant horror, perhaps even a convert to Tharazdun's twisted cause. Reality is broken. All must be destroyed for it to be created. A new reality free of corruption. Stab, stab, stab. Just another crazy cultist. Twisted, evil, and senselessly violent. They delved too deep into forbidden law, and now their grip on reality is busted. So, the gods, both good and evil, trapped Tharazdun physically, he cannot leave his crystal cyst uh, in the ethereal realm, but there are uh, ways to free him. There are 333 gems, each an artifact crafted by celestial and infernal beings, primordials and lords of fey and shadow. These gems are like the keys, each a component to a ritual to undo a kind of a lock, all of which combined can be used to open the door which is the demiplane of Tharistun's prison, a portal into a un- another universe, this one completely subsumed by his own version of the Abyss. This universe is called Void Harrow, and nothing exists in it except Tharistun and the occasional avatar of himself he creates, like a god version of muttering to himself. Within Void Harrow, Tharistun has all of his powers intact, and sometimes, between his insane ravings, he has a moment of clarity during which he will set in motion a possible means of escape. After all, he is incredibly intelligent. During one of these thing, uh, these times of lucidity, he created a persona known as the Elder Elemental Eye. In this guise, he communicated with the evil Arco Elementals, Imix, Ogamoch, Yan Sibin, Olhydra, and the, prin- uh, the princes of Elemental Evil, convincing them that they were his creations, thereby gaining their allegiance. Cults to the Elder Elemental Eye are far more common than cults devoted to Tharistun under his true name and pop up every now and then, usually associated with evil factions that resort to using demons to further their plots for power and dominance. The cults have legends of lost artifacts and holy sites of the chained god. They have one remaining scripture called the Lament for Lost Tharistun, penned by his last cleric, Wongas. There is also the horn known as the Wailer of Tharistun, the Sword of Draniazith, Draniazith? Dran, Dran, Draniaths? Boy, it's hard to pronounce. And the Spear of Sorrow. The Scorpion Crown was gifted to him uh, to the last king of Sulm, and ultimately ended up destroying that kingdom, and the Weeping Hexagram is in the hands of the Scarlet Brotherhood. There's also the three artifacts called the Theoparts, uh, one of law, one of neutrality, and one of chaos. That's from a book series by Gary Gygax. Um, I would suggest these to be deeply ensconced in the clutches of some of Tharistan's monstrous worshippers, the Aboliths, the Grell, and rarely the Neogi, Neogi Salavas. I'll get to doing a monster video on them soon. Those who do know of Tharistan refer to him uh, euphemistically as the Chained God. Most of Tharistan's followers are elementals, or those that have ties to elementals, and refer to him as the Elder Elemental Eye. The majority of the Elder Elemental Eye's cultists, including Tharistan's exarchs, uh, don't even know he is a god, thinking of him instead as a powerful primordial. True cultists of Tharistan are frightening the nihilistic. Their rituals are often unpredictable and feature senseless acts of violence and wanton destruction of his cultists, including murdering people for no reason and just destroying things. These are hallmarks of cult activity of Tharistan. Their doctrine is simply the destruction of all there is. Every action of theirs which disrupts and destroys is seen as a sacred action. They babble nihilistic statements such as emptiness is peace and always seek out to destroy things utterly so there's no trace remaining. Tharistan's temples are always hidden in the darkness. They usually take the form of a black ziggurat, and one of his holy symbols is an inverted black ziggurat to symbolize his inevitable triumph over his imprisonment, um, which he is, he is inevitably going to get free. I mean, entropy is unstoppable. His main holy symbol is a black sun with variegated rays, or the single eye symbol of the elder elemental eye. Warlocks, warlocks can take on the pact of the Great Old One with Tharizdun. He's a perfect candidate for it. The Mad God created an avatar called Sothragot at the time of the Twin Cataclysms. The avatar was thought to have been destroyed, but in reality it only went into dormancy and recently freed. Sothragot hopes to collect the 333 gems of Tharizdun and set its master free. It will probably do so both personally and by using envoys such as player characters who have been duped 
into following these leads. Theros Dune is described in Dragon Magazine 294 as a pitch black roiling amorphous form. His portfolios include Madness, Force, Evil, Destruction and Chaos. He's got quite a few really good Force spells that you can delve into. And although he has his full powers within Void Harrow, he is... Uh, if he ever stepped foot outside of his prison, he would drop to the capacity of an intermediary god. Um, however, demons come and go at his beck and call, and he is basically their creator and master, so he has amazing powers um, of destruction. Cultists of Therosden will seek out trapped and imprisoned demons and deliberately free them. It was Therosden's corruption of the elemental chaos with the creation of the Abyss and his subsequent rallying of the primordials against the gods of the Astral Sea, that which was the cause of the cosmic conflict we know as the Dawn War. So yeah, there are still a great many prim primordials themselves in prison for millennia who would jump at the chance to free Therosden after they freed themselves just to carry on that senseless destruction. So that's Thursday for you. Uh, if you have any questions about Thursday, feel free. I think I've pretty much covered most of the bases there. He makes an excellent uh, aspect of cultists in your game. And yeah, particularly the real mad evil ones. The guys that you just point at them and go, yeah, destroy them all. They're crazy. Um, but again, there's that sick reasoning at the heart of it that makes Thursday so compelling. That nihilism of like, well, we need to destroy the universe to make a new one because this one's broken, which essentially it is. If those of you who uh, have commented on my videos before saying, well, there's so much darkness in D&D. &D, yeah, there is, for a good reason. The universe has been broken. Evil things broke in from outside and, and messed it up. And uh, their only hope of just restoring order and, and, uh, and stuff is destroying everything and creating a new universe. So, yeah. <laughs> great okay i'll be back soon with another video shortly folks i've got the script half written already and that's on the astral dragon and the astral sea i'll catch you again soon